Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval Verona and specifically from the origins, let's say, of the city to the rise of the Ezzelins in the 13th century. So as for the last uh, medieval Italian um, commune video, we will split into videos with 1200 uh, as a watershed because there is really a lot to tell about this uh, city-states and today we actually look at uh, at best at the communal phase uh, and mostly concentrating on the early say the, the high middle ages uh, as well but probably tomorrow I will uh, complete this because aside from the schedule I, I have already the, the pictures researched them at some other point and uh, we should begin properly with the history of the city in a very brief way because Verona has an important um, pre-Roman and Roman past uh, where the city was born as first uh, as an oppidum fundamentally and the origins of the city are we know the uh, St. Peter's Hill was inhabited uh, since the Neolithic age we can well document migrations of nomads since the the fourth millennium BC. This position that in fact was elevated above the Adige River. So we're talking, and as we will see this especially in the wars of the Lombard and the Veronese League, telling you truth that also in fact existed in, in the northeast of Italy, played a major political and strategic importance as far as you understand with the Brenner Pass, this um, waterway and the, the, the roads uh, coast in it connected Italy with Germany and so for every uh, expedition that the Emperor wanted to undertake in the peninsula uh, Verona represented effectively the, uh, the, the the gateway and the most important center on the on the line uh, and naturally the position favored the expansion of the settlement that um, you know the classic historiographers attribute to different founders, some say the the vanity, others the uh, canomany goals. And there are other hypotheses, even the Rathians, the Ogane, the, the Etruscans, as a matter of fact. Um, and it's fair to say that the Po Valley was fun fundamentally Celticized at some point, even if the vanity weren't really a um, a Celtic people, or at least we don't know. Some have said they were Italic. Some said that they were mm, something else, like saying the Ligurians, other peoples that we can't understand clearly what kind of ethnicity they were. Um, the mythology following, you know, the, the the Trojan cycle says, of course, that the city had been founded by some refugees from Ilion, uh, and so on. Um, but uh, surely it was an important center since antiquity, and the vanity that ruled the area fundamentally supported the Romans in the in the conquest of Cisalpine Gaul, supporting, in fact, the wars waged uh, against the Celts in that uh, scenario and being integrated gradually in the Roman domination. In the first century BC, um, they got uh, first the uh, Latin citizenship, then they the, the full Roman one, uh, and it, Verona acquired an important strategic relevance at the time of the Roman conquest of uh, the of the Alpine uh, region, uh, the Vindelice, etc. So it became the base for uh, for also Roman legions temporarily, and then after the conquests, a lot of wealth accumulated. Um, the area was expanded as a typical Roman city. You can still see the famous arena, the, the, the amphitheater, practically, uh, in Verona. And, and the, the, the Roman vestiges, in fact, uh, remained um, crucial so for, the, uh, for the city. Uh, infrastructural importance, uh, this um, northeastern area that we've seen also, mm, I think, last autumn or summer uh, for the, the Friuli. Uh, video was um, exposed also in, from the northeast uh, across the Alps from the barbarian invasions. Uh, Marcus Aurelius campaigned uh, to dislodge the uh, the, the Marcomanni, the quality from 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 Aquileia, and uh, Verona was closed. Uh, 
then in the uh, crisis of the third century mm, Emperor Gallienus for example in established himself there. Um, telling the truth, already Vespasian had uh, encamped with his forces in Verona because it was well fortified but it also had somehow flatlands in the surroundings which he could use his cavalry. And uh, Gallienus reinforced it further, the same amphitheater was used uh, as a fortress as it started happening from the uh, late antique and the early uh, Middle Ages, and aside from the fact that this Regio Decima, Venetia et Istria, that was in fact the, the one which the, the city was framed, was particularly relevant and always from a, from a military point of view of some sort, as a sort of frontier, right, and, um, and with important uh, connection points, Verona is not just located um, let's say on, on the Adige Valley, but is close to the Garda Lake that somehow shelters it, then kind of um, from the other side has the Euganian hills and in, in the south it can easily kind of reach the, the Paul River so um, it maintained throughout telling the truth also modern contemporary history you think about the wars of, of Italian independence the fortress of Rivoli uh, close to Verona that the Austrian army held uh, maintained this kind of um, a role and even though naturally the city had uh, ups and downs, we will see it in this couple of videos, um, it always maintained an importance properly as an urban center. And in fact, by the end of the Western Roman Empire, actually, uh, Verona was also, as it was reconquered by the Byzantines, one of the single largest cities in the empire at the time. Just a, a very few other centers, most importantly northern Italy, together with Milan, for, uh, of course. But aside from Aphrodisias, the Saint Constantinople, Rome, etc., Verona stands among some of the, the top ones, still, in terms of size and of, um, in fact, also population for the time standards, which, which is relevant. Uh, Verona, I think, reached something like 25,000 inhabitants uh, in antiquity. Then it, it went down uh, towards the early Middle Ages, um, towards the high ones instead reached 10,000 and it kept increasing uh, uh, later, even multiplying the number. Right. So again, the relevance here, and especially in late antiquity, has had grown by the time of Constantine. Look at the reliefs of, about the siege of, of Verona and the same arc of, of the emperor. In Rome, right? Already tells you this, you know, the the relevance after all in, in there when also politically, territorially, everything was shrinking. You can't speak of a broader encastellation in medieval times, and surely Verona's position was uh, was privileged. And as we will learn now, uh, it it would even particularly play uh, a role in the. Uh, in the movements between, in fact, Central Europe and and Italy, but con consider the area had w w had been crossed uh, by the the Amber Road that connected up to the Baltic. Um, at some point, Verona was encompassed even by, by the, the Mark of Bavaria uh, all, all together as a as a district. There were still kind of different areas from uh, the two sides of the Alps, but Still, the we've seen it for the video on Friuli that, that northeastern Italy at some point was kind of more uh, influenced by a, a Germanic dimension. Not much Verona, but in the case of the Patriarchate of, of um, Aquileia, for example, we, we notice how even from political and military culture there are greater resemblances with Central than uh, Southern Europe. And Verona... Uh, gathered a lot of this cultural influence and legacy also from, from the Germanic conquerors. As you'll see, it was uh, a major Longobard um, city, and the memory of the Longobards also in the later um, communal and seigneurial times was very alive. This is uh, somehow overlooked, because even the symbolism of the Scaliger dynasty, for example, owes 
match in, in, in the onomastics as well. So we'll see with the uh, Trinocephaly um, uh, legion of, of the Sarianga Bardor and beyond, you know, you see the, the berserkers, the wolf nurse in this case, um, and more. But let's go uh, by order. And let's start as always with Odoacar, leader of the Eroli and the Turchilingi, peoples who were part of the imperial army in Italy who deposed Romulus Augustus and put an end to the Western Roman Empire in 476, reverting the imperial insignia to Constantinople. Uh, so at this point Odoacar had no real investitures, but de facto governed uh, and, and left even a somehow positive memory in the Veronese area, right? Because there was factually, as we've explained many times, no real change compared uh, to previous times, right? Uh, Odoacar was an Aryan, but he wouldn't oppose uh, the Nisan Ephesian Christians. So the point was to rule from this more somehow compact uh, Italian peninsular dimension and maintaining controls on the broader, uh, especially northern and eastern um, bordering regions that, in fact, the same gods would would, uh, would m maintain control of up, up to the Danube. And uh, Italy had not undergone major destructions, right? Of course, there had been a contraction, the population had uh, shrank, etc. But um, differently from what would happen with the Gothic War, there was no major mm, political, social unhingement from this all. These bands of essentially Germanic warriors made up what had by that point been for, for a long time that way the the, the regional army and Odoacar were simply at the head of them, right, as a sort of, of monarch. And um, Odoacar uh, kept governing, administering through the Roman uh, rule, right? He mm, also somehow managed to keep uh, control of, of his army uh, that was simply settled with the usual system of the hospitalitas that con consisted in, theory in the confiscation of a third of the lands, but from the landowners and the redistribution to the soldiers, but more concretely actually the simple payment of one third of the annona and thus um, what was essentially the, the soldierly salary right um, and because for for that matter these these elements were already integrated in the system there was a moment of agricultural economical development uh, the peasantry uh, was um, relieved partially of, of the taxes, um, slavery was somehow mitigated, right? Um, this was a process was already starting since late antiquity, but uh, let's say these um, Germanic rulers had mostly the problem of sharing power with Roman senators who had still perfectly intact their enormous latifundia were dramatically powerful and thus uh, say playing the card let's say of the increase in in liberty of, of the, the the colonists right that weren't technically even uh, slaves but still were strictly controlled by their masters uh, were essentially locking a lot of especially um say military resources for for the for the same masters because uh, at the end of the day, the Germans had the, the same problem within their own system, that is, that, that there were some noble men that thought, say, to, uh, to be somehow freer from, the, from uh, the, the leader, the main leader, than they thought. So Otto Acker w was actually trying to make things work, balancing out a, a bit the both sides in, in an also kind of similar uh, ways. Um, serfs were were not technically free, they were still bound to their masters, but they were a growing force in, in, a, in a shrinking world when uh, the, the, the latifundium was seen ev as e an ever more fragile system, right? an ever more critical one. 
could be essentially uh, unhinged and in order to install a kind of more public idea of power rather than a private one this is this is what just the longer birds would succeed in doing at the end of the day because the Ostrogothic um, war had uh, practically disintegrated that Latifundi. Um, thus in this still essentially late antique reality Verona remained a city of primarily um, strategic importance However, although Odoacre managed to stop the Rugi that were, in fact, pressing from the northeastern frontier, he uh, couldn't prevent the invasion of Theodoric the Great, king of, of the Ostrogoths, that had been sent to Italy from the Balkans by Zeno, the emperor of Constantinople. Made lots of videos about the Ostrogoths, we'll keep talking about them, but you know the story. Uh, in 488, uh, hundreds of thousands of Ostrogoths, talking about the entire population plus other groups, right, so just actually a, a minority of them were, were an army, but still for the time's demographic resources availability were one of the largest coalitions that had put themselves in motion, perhaps at, at that point the largest um, in the interest of time, because the, the Longobards would have, you know, a larger one, but uh, that was the largest in absolute terms during the migration year but this already was pretty big, right? Um, Theodoric managed to beat Odoacre in open field precisely in the Battle of Verona, right? So outside the city. Uh, this was fought on December the 30th, uh, 488, in what the sources call the Veronensis Minor Campus, so the that lesser field of, of Verona, which is probably um, today's area of um, St. Martin, Buonalbergo, which is a flat land, so uh, ideal also for, for a clash of that kind. And at that point, Odoacre and his militias were forced to flee and to take refuge in Ravenna, that, as you know, had been essentially the capital uh, of the west, uh, essentially the, the one of Italy, uh, at that point, it was well protected by marshlands and um, substantially fortified. It was, in fact, one of the largest cities um, in the empire as well. And the Ostrogoth besieged it uh, for four years, or three or four years, um, after which Odoacre capitulated. And the story goes that Theodoric killed firsthand Odoacre when he uh, finally surrendered taking control of Italy, of her dependencies uh, in the north, uh, in the east, thus accomplishing this de facto regime change that for the rest wasn't even particularly, in fact, um, impacting, in, again, in the political social structures. Uh, it brought in this other consistent demographic resources, making, in fact, Ostrogoth Italy the most powerful um, entity in, in, in the West, and as you know, even managing to extend vassalage on Visigothic Spain, expanding in Provence, uh, ransoming Sicily back from, from the Vandals, and a lot of other interesting things. In fact, um, Ostrogoth Italy is plausibly the best example historically of Rom Romano Germanic coexistence, still in a time where the de facto the two the two peoples were separated because traditionally, as we've seen, the Germans took care of, of, of the army and the, the Romans of, of the civil administration and in Theodoric's consistorium in Ravenna, Germanic chieftains and Roman senators were equally represented. Theodoric was Arian, but the first thing he does when he seizes control of Italy is to go to Rome to honor the Pope. So from Constantinople, mission accomplished because they managed to, to get rid of this quite um, consistent people on the on the Balkan frontier and fundamentally normalizing it also in, a, in an anti-Frankish fashion that at that point was growing uh, particularly warring, especially after 
um, Clovis had, as you know, took over the, the kingdom of, of Soissons and the Franks were rising as a major power uh, in Gaul, even crushing the Alamanni that uh, took refuge in the, uh, today's the, the Swiss Alps that were controlled by Theodoric at the time, g gave them shelter. Um, and as we've explained in our recent Swiss history videos, uh, th there is much of that kind of older a legacy even in the medieval Swiss armies and so on as a form of, um, of folk, um, you know, also in terms of military organization and so on. Uh, the reign of Theodoric began in 493. The official capital remained Ravenna, but Verona was the most important strategic center, not only, but also the preferred seat of Theodoric. So much so that in the Germanic epos, famously enough, Theodoric is known as Dietrich von Bern, that is to say properly Theodoric of Verona. Right in all the all the sagas, the, the stories, uh, the Rosengarten, etc., he always bears the name of the city, which is fascinating because of course these were just also as Alboin later, all great uh, heroes that whose, whose uh, history is circulated. I mean, these this were essentially the, the Germans ruling over the, the very center of the Roman Empire, so they were considered as the top um, uh, com rulers, heroes, uh, commanders, and they, they exalted the fantasy, um, the, the, the warrioristic, the, um, uh, let's say, even dreams and ambitions of, of other peoples, like as he did that, others so we we could we can't play the same game uh, too. And Theodoric um, returned Verona her splendor in many ways um, as his residence. He restored her and strengthened the walls damaged by previous barbarian incursions, also uh, making us realize how uh, central and need needed the, the the defensive capacities at least of the cities were because the Burgundians and the Alamanni just across the Alps were yet to pacify at that point but uh, as we've seen there were also somehow eastern threats which in, in a wider sense the Ostrogoths themselves uh, have been as we've seen they had defeated uh, Odoacer at Verona herself thus um, surely the city played a very relevant role in Theodoric's mind. Um, the king had also numerous um, civil buildings restored, including the baths and the aqueduct, showing how relevant also the, the, the population uh, really was. And Theodoric had also a palace built that bore his name near the hill of St. Peter, the palace of Theodoric that, however, is no longer standing, uh, similar to the so-called Theodoric Palace in, in Ravenna, right? So mm, th there was a, for, for the city that uh, already in Roman times displayed that kind of municipalism that we mostly identify even today in a campanilistic sense, but from stemming from the communal tradition uh, of Italy actually has to do with this kind of, in fact, the foe, like politically speaking, urban horizon of the main centers of the peninsula were somehow competing with one another. Ravenna with Rome, uh, also this eastern part of the Po Valley with, with the western one, uh, Milan, um, Pavia, v Verona, and so on. And so this um, aspect would be beneficial actually to the same uh, civil development of these centers that strengthened their kind of, um, in fact, uh, identity, pride, and uh, civic and municipal institutions. So Verona has a great late antique center, even uh, royal residence mm -hmm. in a fully Romano-Germanic context. So in internal politics, uh, Theodoric followed essentially uh, what was Odoacer's strategy, because again, the, the main core of Theodoric's power was um, was Italy. Uh, the Ostrogoths had been settled again through the hospitalitas system in great part in northern Italy because of the Alpine passes and so this somehow military, more militarized dimension because uh, Cisalpine Gaul 
uh, as you know from uh, Augustan times have properly entered the a repartition of the Italian regions, right? So it was considered Italy already. But uh, especially in this time of um, international traffic contractions and so on, had not really followed like the course of, of the rest of the peninsula, like the center and the south were more connected, ideally, to Provence, for example, or the, the, the southeast, especially to, um, to the same Constantinople, uh, the same Ravenna being a, ga a gateway uh, uh, towards the east, right? And uh, this this um, Cisalpine dimension remains set somehow uh, more uh, more on its own and developing certain characteristics that uh, were fueled further by the fact that essentially the the Longobards installed there the, their true um, center of power and, and developing it in a statal sense. Um, Lots of Ostrogoths were settled all across the Apennine because that was, uh, as you understand, also very strategically important. And as we will see now during the Gothic Wars, uh, it took a lot like, to, to not even to dislodge them because some of them would at, at some point be defeated and remaining there. Just like, I don't know, the Vandals. Many were deported, that is true. But some re remained on the African frontiers eh, as they had been. Are remaining there. The, the same is true, and especially for the the Italian north, because was in a sense for especially the Byzantines the least relevant one, the most decentralized one. And uh, in order not to trigger some further resistance, guerrilla and so on. And as we'll see, rather than guerrilla, the the Goths maintained control of the cities, including Verona. So that that was problematic. They preferred to leave them in part just where where they were. Um, and uh, for the rest, uh, Theodoric had, as you know, a much greater um, charisma and authority and and power than than Odoacer. Uh, one of the single most important chapters in medieval history is uh, Theodoric diplomatic international relations, marriages, and so on. Um, Verona was just part of his possessions. That that's how much we can say. Um, and things started going worse, however, towards the uh, end of his reign, as you know, for different reasons, uh, including the tension with the Roman senators that hoped for some sort of properly imperial, uh, direct imperial coming back uh, to be fully reintegrated in the circle of trade and so on, whereas Theodoric was carrying out properly a, an Italian policy rather than the universal one. And um, this had brought to especially suspicion regarding the, the main divide of the time, which was not even on, a, on an ethnic pattern, but on a, on a religious one, right? The, the Aryans and the Orthodox began to essentially um, plot against one another. As you know, Theodoric has some of, also some of his most important Catholic uh, functionaries of court um, either assassinated or uh, exiled and um, the th this was a problem that we we see also among the Vandals, among the, the gods uh, in Spain I mean that um, was skipped for example completely by the Franks that converted that straight away to Catholicism and also by the Longbirds that um, took a bit more time to, to convert to Catholicism, but also didn't have this strong, powerful senatorial competitors within to actually carry out any form which is not traced by any degree of, of any form of persecution. In 535, after the death of Theodoric, Italy was invaded by the Byzantines. Mm -hmm. Starting from, they, they started from Africa and then Sicily, a bit like the Allied in World War II, and they rose up. Then eventually Narsus intervened after Belisarius had somehow accomplished the work, but further rebellions broke out from the north. Um, and so there was a Dalmatian invasion um, through the Adriatic. Uh, at this time, Verona was commanded by the Goth Ildibald, who after the fall of Ravenna in Byzantine hands in 540, was temporarily elected king by the Goth leaders. Uh, upon 
his death, the, the crown, however, passed to his nephew, Totila, an excellent mm, ruler and, and commander who, as you know, carried out this major re-reconquest, right, is coming back and uh, actually he, he was the direct responsible of much of, of the Italian destruction at that point, but that was carried out as a sort of, in fact, scorched earth strategy to defend the same uh, Gothic Italy. And he is somehow a, a romantic figure that um, uh, followed uh, Theodoric's policy expropriating the large estates um, of the Latifundia that were collapsing because of the war a anyway, because also the Byzantines, frankly, were hardly you know, what the, at least the, the Italic senators uh, would consider Roman at that point. The, the differences were really large. Um, and accepting even slaves in his army. This was the point, right? He, Tosila appealed famously to the Roman colonists by saying, if you join our resistance against the Romans, you will become a god fundamentally. You will become fully free. And this brought, uh, in fact, an enormous degree of moral and material resources from the Gothic side, and that's why the Gothic War was actually so terrifying in many ways, aside from, because it was mostly the second stage, the first one it was, uh, after all, a relatively smooth Byzantine conquest um, but, as you know, the removal of Belisarius and some other thing that was going on uh, behind the scenes of history uh, that was not documented brought to the collapse of this first conquest and so armies made back and forth like two, three times um, in a row for years, uh, devastating, destroying, um, and so on. And as you know, the, uh, the Goths lost uh, in the end. The Byzantines, with about 12,000 men, attempted an attack on Verona at some point, managing to get a hundred soldiers inside the walls at night with a coup. The gods were surprised, and as it normally happened in, in, in siege in warfare, like there was some attempt to rally in the main square, the forum, uh, and trying to counter the enemy attack. The gods were surprised, uh, and uh, not knowing the entity of the forces that had gotten in the city, uh, fled to the hills n uh, north uh, of the center. But after realizing the uh, relative contained number of the enemies that were inside, and the fact they were probably the, uh, pretty disorganized um, because of you know some we we don't know like some divisions in command historiography says um, for the division of the booty. So having initially actually succeeded in really getting um, their hands over the the riches of the city. They counterattacked them and forced them to flee and retreat across the Po River. So Verona was a hotbed of resistance, as we've seen, and uh, somehow tough not to, to crack. Totila was killed in battle, and so his successor, Teia. Um, during the latter's government, um, Verona un underwent some, some decline because of, of the war that was still raging, some buildings and roads were beginning to fall in, into ruin, and um, uh, even after the king had been uh, killed, Verona kept resisting for some time to the Byzantine army commanded by the eunuch of court Narses, and oddly enough, on this occasion, the Gothic resistance of Verona was stiffened by the Franks that, far from being particularly friendly with the Ostrogoths and having actually invaded the Venices uh, during the conflict, taking advantage of, of the general chaos, on that occasion you know, were convinced to resist against the Byzantines themselves. These were kind of, uh, you know, autonomous bands, you know, that at the end even... Uh, they, they they crossed even up to southern Italy be before being defeated by Narses, and they were like autonomous bands of Franks, of n newly subjected Alamanni, Burgundians, that simply said, you know, let's go do some mess uh, in Italy because their power has evaporated, and so they contributed to, um, to this, the destructions, but in this case of Verona, actually, to some 
a support uh, to the um, to the last gods that at, that at this point were broken. So if anything, uh, it's just like at, at the end of the Second World War, like the Cold War had already began. And uh, in fact, if the Longobards hadn't gotten in between, the, the Franks and the Byzantines would have had some sort of, of showdown. In fact, the Byzantine Reconquest, and I made a video about that, was also aimed at properly an Atlantic perspective, is to say, countering the Merovingians that were, as the Carolingians would prove, just very interested in the Mediterranean, and that would see in Italy the object of contempt, right? Also because of Rome and uh, you know all what follows. Uh, we will see it now even with the uh, which Charlemagne conquest and so on. Procopius tells about this um, last stage of the Gothic War when uh, the general, the Roman general Valerian, after the defeat of Totila, attempted to besiege Verona in 552. The local garrison, which was already thinking of surrendering and despairing of resisting, was saved, however, properly by the intervention of a Frankish army, uh, which was uh, in the neighboring areas, for the reasons that we just explained. The Gothic War officially ended in 555 with the surrender of um, Konza in, in Campania, but in the Venices and in Transpadane, Italy, there were still, first of all, the, the Franks to be driven out, as we've seen, because they had already intruded. In addition to the last remnants of the Ostrogothic army that, as we explained before, were essentially settled as military colonists. They, they were now, from, from multiple generations, already uh, part of the local uh, a part of the country so and and s these um, units still refuse to surrender and among the pockets of resistance still in the hands of the Ostrogoths there was also Verona which together with Brescia that lays in the in the in the west right just across the Garda Lake um, continued to resist right so in an area that was important because it could again received support also from the north, uh, it was relatively sheltered by these um, rivers, lakes, um, natural obstacles, were considered important amount of fortifications that at some point we can't even archaeologically trace, but um, the old, the, say, the, 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 the collapse of the Roman Empire had brought to all a series, as you know, of encastellation, of, you know, creation of blocks, and especially in this kind of um, areas crossed by important riverways um, so castra scattered here and there pretty complicated area and plus uh, far in the north so stretching the byzantine uh, supply lines and so on in 556 uh, the imperial army began to reconquer uh, these northern territories still outside of, in uh, fact, Byzantine control. Um, already in 559, Milan and a large part of the uh, Venice region were in Byzantine hands. Mm -hmm. These were important areas. Milan fundamentally was the, the most important Roman city in, in the north and um, also strategically that a bit like the key of, of the Pau Valley entirely, but this northeastern part was still kind of problematic. In fact, Verona and Brescia still resisted. Hmm? Uh, and around 561, Narses faced with the refusal of the commander of the Frankish army in northern Italy, who was this Amingus, to grant the imperial permission to cross the Adige river, on which Verona lays, marched against the Franks, who in the meantime had allied themselves with a rebel Gulf general named Vidin, right? Uh, and uh, pr probably he was commander of the garrison of Verona himself. Um, and Narses managed to crush both in battle, resulting in the expulsion of the Franks from Italy and more or less simultaneously, 
say between 561 and 562, the surrender of the last pockets of Gothic resistance, these, as we've seen, Verona and Brescia, the keys of which, right, the, the, the keys of, of the city gates, which were sent to Constantinople. Verona fell on July the 20th, 561, Brescia in the same year, uh, or at the latest, the, the following one, while the news of the surrender of the two centers reached Constantinople only in November 562. Um, and uh, this timeline is interesting because normally you, you're, you're told in the, in the history books the Gothic War lasted 535, 553. It's easy to remember because you just you switch the, the last two numbers. Um, and instead, uh, resistance in some areas, and especially in fact in this northeast, and in again one of the largest cities, technically what was still considered altogether the the, the the Roman Empire, held out, and with this kind of uh, Franco-Gothic um, partnership. Naturally, all done in very uh, like you. You can't compare these figures as sort of condottieri, right? It wasn't like an official Frankish policy. Of course, um, there was a chance from from the north. Surely, Clovis had some involvement in this all to kind of make leverage on on Byzantine Italy through these individuals. But say the actual rule of these bands and leader was very loose. Mm -hmm. Plus, there were lots of people from, from everywhere considered this, like all murderers, adventurers from from Germany, from, from other peoples around that were looking right at, at the situation. Considered, think about the Longbirds that here were serving in the Byzantine army and that had already seen what Italy was about. They knew the gods at that point. They had, you know, that they, they had been neighbors. Um, at some point, the Longobards had been some sort of vassal people of 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 Theodoric, so they they began to understand what options were present there because the the country was exhausted. By the way, the plague had broken out; uh, it, it 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 was devastated, meaning that the the Byzantines didn't have any resource to create or to maintain like a permanent um, local. Mm, field army, right? And uh, the the country, however, still remained particularly rich. So it was a very good opportunity for everyone interested, and especially the neighboring longbirds, right? Um, so we owe it to this Veronese resistance, actually, the extension of the of the Gothic resistance uh, at least. And in fact, we pass to the longbirds that surely took contact with the local Gothic garrisons that the Byzantines actually maintain in some areas, think about Treviso in this northeast, etc., that famously opened the gates to him, uh, to Alboin, I mean, and um, who, as you know, was de facto the king of the Longobards. It's, it's a big word at this time of Longobard history because he was just a, basically the most important leader, surely had affirmed himself um, uh, very very successfully, he had crushed the, the Gepids and partly integrated them, he had uh, led, in fact, this victorious expedition in Italy and he was very famous in all the Germanic epochs for it um, and he was the one who stripped Verona from the Byzantines, right? In 568 he entered Italy via the um, the Paco Valley and Civitale, as we've seen in the video about Friuli, uh, the latter remaining essentially a, a frontier mark of some sort of, of the Longbird, so-called Austria, that however encompassed also Verona as this kind of more northeastern reality as opposed to the west, the, the Neustria, the, the Lombardy proper. As most Byzantine uh, centers in northern Italy, Verona was undefended at the time of the Longbird invasion and thus was occupied without bloodshed. Mm -hmm. uh, I discuss this aspect of the Longbird settlements in the videos dedicated to the people. You can find a playlist um, on. And even though we don't have any 
explicit evidence of this, historiography today thinks that the Longobard migration, albeit surely was an act of force, um, was planned, uh, negotiated, and organized uh, with with the Byzantines. Right? We wanted to essentially create a sort of buffer state between central and southern Italy and the the transalpine power of Clovis, um, a migration that instead went out of hand, because literally, like from Constantinople, there was no thing like, you know, sending an army, news of panic, uh, like from the contemporary survey saying, oh my god, the Longobards had invaded, what a terrible thing. So the idea, also because there is no evidence of destruction archaeologically and so on, it, and even the the siege of Pavia of the lasting three years is actually just a literary tradition saying that from from later times and copying a bit what had been Theodoric's siege of Ravenna because that had been so famous and important that everybody wanted to copy that. In that case, also for the Longobards, actually it seems that everything was pretty smooth. Of course, there were some Byzantine garrisons that existed here and there and some pre-alpine lakes, but. The, the thing went literally that for some years they say that there was, for example, an island in the Como Lake uh, and there were Byzantines on it and the Longobards on the shore. And they, they start simply coexisting until some day without apparently any bloodshed, you know, the Byzantines, you know, gave up and simply started living there without, with, with the Longobards without any problem. And this is literally what actually happened. Right, and that's why also the Longobard conquest, considering that the previous Roman uh, senatorial structure had somehow collapsed during the war, and the Byzantines were factually some foreigners by now what were becoming Italian standards, that they had a, actually a very good grip on, especially the center of power, what we call Langobardia Maior, so the, the north, northern Italy, mostly overlapping with the Po Valley, then extending also to Liguria, to Tuscany, and making roughly up what you you would consider later as the, the kingdom of Italy, in fact, in also in a geographical sense, because institutionally also was the same, as you know, as Charlemagne simply integrated the Longobard one in, in, the, in the Carolingian, in the imperialist system, but that um, that also Verona was part of, that, that's what I mean. Um, in fact, uh, the city became, at this point, actually, the capital of Italy, at least briefly, until 571, when the seat of the Longobard court was moved to Pavia, where it would remain the capital of the Italic kingdom with the Iron Crown, etc., However, the Veronese territory was erected as a duchy, right? It became one of the most important duchies in the Longobard kingdom that, as you know, was split in duchies differently from, say, the, the Frankish one that was split in counties, um, except for some southern territory that was probably uh, created by the Romans where they, when they settled in southern Italy, some, some Longobard mercenaries while in fact there was still a Roman administration and naturally also the Franks had copied from the Gallo-Roman administration the the Comitatus like as a as a administrative district with the diocese and so on. The 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 Longobards instead were more about kind of properly the idea of the of the dukes, of the military leader and so they they created duchies instead. Which meant of course that um, the Dukes of Verona, first of all, were very important because uh, Verona was um, at least, I think, the second most powerful duchy of the Longobard Austria of the Northeast. The most powerful one was was indeed the one of Friuli, right? But Verona had the honor of hosting the, as we've seen initially, the properly the capital of the kingdom, and then as the first duke, Authory, that would be also the first king of the Longbirds, at least of the properly unified and never broken again kingdom at the end of the 6th century after the assassination of Alboin and of Clef, they were the first two kings, and the so-called ducal anarchy that lasted from 574-584. So Authory had been in charge of Verona, 
and he was also the Longobard king who literally beheaded half of the Pop Valley between Byzantines and uh, and rebellious Longobards who were again probably settled in Italy as Byzantine Federati and that were fighting in fact for the empire against this kind of more you know um, self-aware Longobard potential opportunity that began to realize the necessity of creating a kingdom proper because otherwise up to that point again the Longobards were very uh, let's say alien to the concept of a territorial dominion where semi-domanic people they had all different clans but they realized once they settled uh, in Italy and they had to rule that country that, uh, that with that urban net with that amount of population etc they needed uh, a kingdom an administration they needed of course to cooperate uh, immediately with the Romans etc uh, other famous dukes of Verona were Giselbert, Zangrulf and Lupo um, some of their stories are very interesting because um, they they were somehow warlike, like the Longobard Austria was, was considered the place where the, the hardcore of the Longobard traditions had somehow remained compared to the more kind of Romanized and gentrified uh, Neustria, Milan, Pavia and so on. Just Longobard kings, uh, you know, attended um, the, you know, the races in the Milanese circus just as Roman emperors for that matter um, and this um, the, we will perhaps make a video I, I, I want to make a video about the Frankish Neustrian Austrasia and the Longobard Neustrian Austria so we'll talk about that um, more in detail but the, the Veronese dukes were pretty warlike at some point they competed also for power against the, the Longobard kings never in a secessionistic way because it was by far no political strategic intention of the Nor uh, of the Austrian Longobards to 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 break the kingdom. Just they competed for literally becoming kings, or uh, however having some uh, issues with the kings uh, as far as the local administration was concerned. Um, and if you look at these names, they bear Zangrulf, Lupo. These are meaning wolf, right? And if you look at the Veronese and the broader Venetian toponym, you know that the modern region in Italy is known as Veneto and it takes from the name after the the the, the, the in fact the, the Venetic people um, but the, the Roman Veneti eventually so uh, it has technically not much to do with Venice even though uh, the city eventually conquered as we will see in the next video these lands later but um, in the broader area has uh, the broader Venetian area has um, um, an, an incredible amount of Longobard toponism, toponyms especially connected with the wolf onomastics either the wolf or the, the dog, the hound um, and there are lots of legions that uh, in, fa in fact also in the heraldic um, symbolism were meant to stress the concept of loyalty Right, especially in in the Ghibelline period that we will see in, better in, in the next video with the Esselins and the Scaliger dynasties. These were uh, proud and fierce uh, imperial vicaries of Italy, in Italy, and as such, they resumed this onomastics that w the, that was um, calling names. Just think about Can Grande, which means you know great dog or or mastino which means hound because uh, and they had them in their um in their crin in their knightly crests and uh, coat of arms and so on because they expressed the the absolute loyalty of those pack of wolves that in the odinic uh, religion and in, in the germanic commentators has to do with the, the followers the retinues of the of the hero and that in that case were the emperor uh, with his loyal, fanatically loyal vassals. And you see uh, the, the, the termination can is very, which means dog, um, in Venetian is very famous. And, you know, there are many centers called like that. And not only, because um, the story is of the Scaliger dynasties, especially connected, not just with Verona, of course, because they were Veronese, but the symbol of the Scala, that is the ladder from which the, the, 
that the dynasty takes the, the emblem from is connected to a legend that has to do with the burial place of Alboin himself that allegedly would have been in fact buried in uh, under a uh, a ladder right uh, in 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 the palace of Verona and thus the heraldic symbolism referred also to this strictly long bird heritage that uh, northeastern Italy felt to have uh, particularly right and it doesn't end here actually I could make a video about this because um, it goes out tr throughout the early high and even late Middle Ages as we just noticed just to tell you how Im impacting the Longobard legacy was in these places um, and in fact during the Longobard domination uh, Verona remains among the main cities of the Langobardia Maior, alongside Milan, uh, Cividale, and the capital Pavia, where the royal palace was. Um, Alboin, you know the story, he, the, the legion he's killed by his wife uh, Rosamund in Theodoric's palace in Verona, where in fact, uh, you know, the, the legion goes that... Uh, the uh, the eventually the, the the same Alboin had himself buried because of Ravenna was where where Theodoric was buried in the famous mausoleum was in the hands of the Byzantines so Verona embodied more even kind of that Gothic Longobard legacy right and the story is interesting because you know what uh, Rosamond Rosamond does she basically betrays Alboin with a squire who was apparently um, sort of it was a long bird, but he was pro Byzantines. Rosmond allegedly hated Alboin because, well, the guy, according to the story, had literally made her drunk from the skull of, of, of her father, you know, the Jepidic king. And uh, that was actually a compliment. I mean, the story of her drinking from his father, her father's skull, is invented just for the sake of drama because actually um, respecting her meant a lot in terms also of the maintaining control of ju the Jupitic element under the long birds and drinking from an enemy's skull is is a compliment you don't drink from a, a slave skull you drink from the skull of, of the guy whose wisdom in theory is the top one of the people so that you get in, into you which is literally one of the Jupitic king um, but those are the cute customs of uh, you know that were in vogue at the time but it they always have a deep anthropological meaning. In any case, the, the thing takes place in 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 Verona and um, in this pretty troubled time again where it wasn't definitely not clear whether the, the Longobards had to create a kingdom of their own or they were rather uh, Byzantine federati and so on. And it said Arthur brought kind of an order. Many Longbirds served in the Balkans, they became important commanders, um, also in Armenia, the Byzantines broke them and so on. But that's another story, maybe again for an, yet another video. And importantly enough, um, in 774, when Charlemagne conquers Italy, the Longbird Kingdom, he comes uh, 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 at the head of the last Longobard resistance exactly in Verona where the son of the last Longobard king Desiderius had been resisting talking about the famous Adelchis about which Manzoni has made also the the, 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 the homonymous tragedy making a bit of romanticism about the whole thing but it's meaningful that the, the, the Longobard prince did actually seek refuge within Verona before, b before being forced to flee eventually he went in southern Italy and then among in Constantinople right because he was at that point backed by the Byzantines to harass the Carolingians with this last kind of um, legacy that he had from from his father but things wouldn't end well um, uh, the fall of the Longobard kingdom corresponded to the birth of the uh, Carolingian Empire in a sense because as you know, no other country was incorporated properly as a, as a political institutional entity on its own during the Carolingian conquests, right? Charlemagne does this, and plus, uh, he in his official titling, he became uh, 
king of the Longobards and king of the Franks, and he, at he attached, like this, this was effectively confirmed in practice by uh, for, uh, for good at the time of his, um, of his son Louis, um, the imperial crown to the Italic one. That is to say, of course, if you wanted to prote protect the papacy successfully, being crowned emperor, you had, first of all, to control the Italic kingdom, which technically didn't include the, the papal states, um, as far especially as the as the, the, the popes were, were concerned. And it's worth remembering that this order went on, at least theoretically, until the 19th century. Following the revolt of Rothgaud in 776, that is yet another very uh, important event that we don't even know exactly in, in the outcome of, militarily speaking, because it seems that the Austrians rebelled against the Franks and even maybe scored a victory, because there are literally just two sources. One... One says uh, that, that Charlemagne won, and another one that the Longobards won, right? And um, Charlemagne, by the way, had to rush from Saxony because this uh, Longobard revolt risked to engulf the whole freaking um, uh, Pau Valley. And um, there was a settlement, uh, after which, actually, the, the Longobard ducal autonomies were... were um, reconfirmed in some ways or even enhanced and yes there is a process of also of replacement by Frankish officials in, in the following generations but in a, in a very smooth way and still with an important consideration of the local community's opinion because um, this was still a, re a relatively frontier area for, for the empire and quite a quite a remarkable one because as we've seen also in the video about medieval Croatia and considering uh, you know, the, the Byzantine naval projectional ca capability, um, the presence of, of Venice, right, in the lagoons that was still Byzantine, Charlemagne's son would die in, in the siege of Venice because of malaria. So it, it was pretty worrying that, that like, a, like the Austrians in a city like Verona would, um, you know, would, would try to slip away from, from direct Carolingian control. Um, given that the Franks, as we've seen, brought the Counts rather than the Dukes uh, in, the, in, in Italy, Verona became now the capital of a county. In 781, Charlemagne assigned his son Pepin, the Longobard part of the empire. He had, again, before his death, we remember before, to be literally the heir of Charlemagne, so this tells you how important, really, um, that the kingdom was, and I made a video last autumn about the Carolingian domination of Italy, if you're interested, that's just more like the political side of the story, we will expand on it at some point, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's remarkable. So during the reign of Pepin, that surely was over Verona as well, numerous churches were restructured and new ones built in Verona, such as the same famous Basilica of St. Zeno, erected on the remains of the, of the primitive early Christian building uh, n built near the tomb of the saint, who was also the patron of the city and a, a major spiritual figure in early Christian history. So um, that was a bit the, um, the Veronese kind of municipal pride as far as the spiritual matters were, were concerned. Pippin also had the Veronese walls readapted to the situation because, generally speaking, the Carolingian conquest had uh, shattered the, the, the Longobard kingdom uh, unavoidably. Um, there was... Uh, I don't think that the Avars were threatening at that point because they were still standing and surely the Austrian Longobards had historically been fighting pretty... Uh, harshly, uh, even suffering, in fact, uh, other raids and destructions, etc. But at that point, rather, it was, seems to me it was a broader political strategic precaution to secure the same 
Carolingian domination in the area. Um, Pepin often stayed in Verona, by the way, at the palace of Theodoric that was still standing, and the same hill of St. Peter, so much so that when he died, as we've seen uh, at the siege of, of Venice, he was buried in Verona. Charlemagne died four years later, but the Carolingian dynasty continued to govern Italy until the deposition of Charles the Fat in 887. I made just recently a video about Rome of Charles the Third, um, that the situation for the empire was advancedly uh, deteriorated. But say up to that point, the uh, the Italian kingdom emerging from the partitions of the empire had somehow done well, right, with following the the lead of the Carolingian dynasts uh, on the wake also of the Longobard administration, the army and so on. They managed even to crush the Saracens in the south to carry out interesting, um, interesting feats. Uh, in any case, the uh, situation in Italy, as you know, would go towards the direction of an increasing autonomization from Transalpine power. It was intermittent from there on, same way, and especially of a political fragmentation locally that wouldn't make the Italic kingdom, um, let's say, elect um, a monarch on its own that would successfully control the entire realm. Right, there were several actually struggling at the same time, including the Veronese one, it was actually one of the most important. Um, the Kingdom of Italy was at this point de facto independent. Again, th there was no power in Europe at the time that could um, concretely dominate the area for, for an important amount of time. In any case, as the Ottonian example shows pretty well, it was a, a top priority for anyone who wanted to become emperor, as we've seen, retaking re control of Italy and of Rome. Um, there was, uh, in, in this interregnum, uh, a gap, right? It's not even properly an interregnum because there were different pretenders to the throne that fought each other, and especially in Italy, since they were next door to Rome, they forced at some point the, the, the Pope to have them elected emperors, literally. And in fact, they were Veronese emperors, that's the point. Um, but the, the world picture was rather disastrous, and actually Verona was being located on the west-east axis, like between Central Europe and the Po Valley, was also hit by the uh, Magyar waves that, in fact, from the Pannonian Plain were reversing themselves literally uh, everywhere in the post-Carolingian kingdoms, uh, in particular in Germany and in northern Italy, but as far as northern Spain, right? so um, pretty dramatically uh, enough. The Magyars naturally intervened also in Italian politics because they were used by mercenaries, by the local kings, so they knew how to uh, find their way through for their loot. Uh, at some point, even paying for it, but um, Verona was pretty involved in, in handling them. Um, Berengar I, Marquis, placed his capital in Verona, where he had also influential figures such as the Bishop Adelard and the Marquis Walfred as advisors. Um, to keep the crown, Berengar had to wage numerous wars, also and famously suffering bitter defeats, until he was killed in Verona herself at the hands of Milo of San Bonifacio, a relative of his. The San Bonifacio will be some of the most important families in, Ver in Veronese history for centuries to come, so very prestigious houses. Uh, the interesting parable of Berengar that it is complex to, um, you know, to to resume, because the 10th century, uh, especially, well, pretty much everywhere in post-Carolingian Europe is is an uh, unhinged mess. But he, again, fought um, several wars with alternating fortunes, mostly um, 
from the negative side, uh, but always kind of managing to come back on his feet and, and, uh, until he was assassinated, but basically surviving for, for the rest most of his adversaries and, you know, living up to an important age for those times. So is is a fascinating figure that shows how the Veronese power base was one of the strongest. He was basically controlling the great part of northeastern Italy and being able to wage campaigns around attempting to secure um, control, exploiting, as it was happening in other post-Carolingian kingdoms, the same second invasions, because as long as those were present, the various vassals, even though they wouldn't have liked to provide power to, to the monarchy, would somehow stick around um, and, and try to get rid of, of, of the major problem, but for the rest, just competing with each other and and constantly clashing. And already at this point you can realize how, let's say, that there is not such a thing like a center of power, right? Even Verona is just located in her own corner where are all the others also, in fact, are uh, limited in, not much in range, but especially in the possibility of, of securing a, a control over the others. Um, and they are at large um, important, also urban-based centers of some sort. Think about the Duchy of Spoleto, the Marquisate of Ivrea, right? And Verona is actually legitimately the most important city, um, uh, leading this political struggle. Um, various kings of Italy succeeded Berenger, the first, um, and it was in particular Berenger the second who formed kind of officially the mark of Verona. Mm -hmm. Mark because uh, it was on the eastern border of the empire mm -hmm. with the Slavs and, and the Magyars. This happened rather for the fact because the, the mark de facto existed already under Berenger the first but at this point it was the emperor because the Ottonians had already um, retaken control of Italy, at least, you know, nominally, and creating this, this German-Italian axis that we eventually came to know as the Holy Roman Empire, but that technically it was just, you know, it, the previous empire since Carolingian times, arguably since Roman times. Um, and you know that I like especially this more controversial one. Um, was uh, recognized, but uh, still um, provided in that sense, stripped from Berengar the second, and uh, given to the emperor's brother, the um, uh, the ruler of Bavaria, and that's 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 the moment in which technically uh, Verona was part of the Bavarian uh, regional district, right in the Holy Roman Empire. It was a way to increase, not naturally, many ways, just formally, the power of a given ruler but also an attempt to uh, reinforce, in fact, the imperial presence in this southeastern German and northeastern Italian area that was, in fact, still in theory in many ways, especially on the easternmost um, frontier, given that it was being consolidated at the expense of other peoples, the, the Slavs, etc. And it, it always um, was unstable. We should focus more on it, we should make a video on um, on Carinthia and Carniola, because those really, those relatives really tell you that they are completely in another world from the other side of the Alps, um, from this actually three sides of the Alps, uh, as a matter of fact, um, the German, the, the Slavic, and, and the Italian one, that in fact were that difficult to mold in a kind of more stable uh, frontier. Uh, interestingly enough, from the 10th century, we have the so-called Veronese riddle, which is an early form of Italian vernacular, sort of, in fact, vulgar Latin. Uh, you, you, you can use different, let's say, criteria to define where one begins and the other ends, but that is quite nice and it recurs um, in medieval literature because it goes in this, again, it, it would, would seem like either Latin or Italian says, and it asks 
you essentially to, to tell what he's talking about. And it, it says, Se pareba boves, alba pratalia raba, et albo versorio teneba, et negro semen sebinaba. All right. So it, it says, it, it looks like oxen. Uh, it, it, it plows uh, white fields, bear in mind the color as well, and it has um, um, a, a white versorium. It holds a white versorium and it sows black seed. Can you guess what this is? It is, spoiler, uh, a human hand writing. Right, so the uh, it looks like a bit like the hand, uh, all um, like a, as a as a punch writer holding the the pen in white. It um, plows over white fields. It is the parchments, and it has this white versorium. So it's talking about the pen literally, and it. Uh, sows black seed, which is the ink, right? And it appears in this area. That, as you understand, this actually has nothing to do with any particular connection between Veronese specifically and uh, the modern linguistic Italian evolution, right? The Italy, in, in that regard, especially, uh, yeah, pretty much, especially in the center and the, in the north, was pretty homogeneous already from a linguistic point of view, especially was starting in this at this point to be a, a dramatically intertwined area with a strong urbanization, the highest literacy levels, actually the highest per capita wealth as we often remember that had uninterruptedly held since Roman times in the world. Mm -hmm. So th there is a great uh, literary culture development, juridical studies as you know, administration, um, the 10th, 11th centuries is the period of the bishops counts where the emperor delegates to the episcopal um, administration the rule of the cities that would have gradually evolved in the communes that uh, also from these retinues you had, you can see not just clergymen actually, but this is the the typical character of, of Italian fact, culture that is a lay one, right? Lots of lay people from, from the city that are highly educated can work um, in the public administration that since longer times was actually very much literate and public thanks to the fact it was grafted on these uh, cities and uh, you know enhanced as such by the longer government um, and uh, and these retinues these notaries these lawyers whatever are some of the same people that would found uh, the, the following century uh, the universities would um, start recovering Roman law, etc. So you have this intellectual vivacity that also Verona contributes to, as we have seen. If I'm not wrong, this, this riddle is just randomly noted in a, in a book. It could be about prayers and on like the last page there is the, the, the guy was studying it like you, you do boredly at university was writing this riddle. Maybe, I don't know, he had heard him he had heard someone telling him. Um, so as we were saying before, uh, in the mid 10th century, the mark of Verona, that again is also a pretty big chunk because it namely encompasses the entire northeastern Italy as a as a lay uh, polity, right? So it obviously controlled uh, as a public one, probably. So it controlled the the lay, the, the ecclesiastical vassals, um, etc. So Verona was a bit the center of this, right? It was temporarily again attached to, to the Duchy of Bavaria, and then even to the Duchy of Carinthia. It was in that kind of uh, transalpine context, but administratively associated. Berengar II, that had been nominally stripped of the 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 marginal title tried to reacquire it but at that point um at the descent of otto the first he lost it again mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was one of the reasons also why the Ottonians intervened more directly in in italy because at this point the northern italian vassals still were pretty involved 
in the, especially in the southern German affairs. And you understand that Verona to the Adige, Etch Valley, and the Brenner Pass would had a, an important connection there. But it's more than that. It's the fact that the Ottonians were to resume uh, a full universal Mediterranean Roman policy. And thus they had to secure control of Verona again because of the Alpine or the major Alpine pass. Um, at this time, uh, Mila of Saint Boniface, Saint Bonifacio, became Marquis of Verona. This geographical aspect, if you want, is particularly important because it's not just about the uh, Germanic expeditions to the south, but it's literally the southern vassals participating to the German diet. Right? This is a bit an aspect that we have tended to you know, just look at either the, the north or the south of the Alps as a separate thing, but especially in this time, during the high Middle Ages, um, the, the participation especially of, of Lombardy, of this Lombard, Lombardy broadly meant, to the German royal policy, the participation of Italian vassals to the German diet in the north, etc., has a great balance in imperial policy. Right, so if the Veronese wanted to lock the Adige Valley and not making whoever pass, well, of course, they would think it twice before putting themselves against the whole imperial army. But at the same time, they could control a, a great deal of those who could pass, wouldn't pass, um, important figures, um, say, maybe not messengers per se, but let's say somebody would could uh, and would go often, as, as much as in this times, think about... In fact, the, the Ottonian phase, but also the, the phase of the investiture controversy. Um, how intense the relations, in all sense, politically, militarily, and socially between uh, the Italic and the Eastern Frankish kingdom re really were. Um, naturally, the Brenner Pass is not the only Alpine one, but it's just the easier one. It's um, considered that the, 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 the a great part of the power, the, the southern Germany was the richest one, right? And still, like, kind of today, right? Aside from, from the West, that is also, in that sense, a product of Romanization, but um, the, and the Rhineland and so on. But if you look at the Franconians, the Swabians, the Habsburgs, you realize that they always tended to, to gravitate around it the southern border, right? The, the Romfart was the single most important and vital uh, connection for the imperial title. Um, and thus, there were lots of reasons for which a contact would be maintained um, between the, the two areas in Thames. Um, there would be more to say, as we will see, uh, Verona uh, participated intensely in, in the wars of the Lombard League and so on. Uh, but at this time already had an important leverage on this bigger picture. In 967, the Emperor Otto II came to Verona to prepare the war against the Saracens. And after he was bitterly defeated, famously enough, in Calabria, he then uh, re, uh, say rallied uh, again in, in Verona. Where, where in 983 he called the Diet, which was attended by um, leading figures from the Kingdom of Italy, also actually the Roman territory, so um, at the areas that had been part under papal control, the one of, of the Exarch, um, and also the bishops of and princes of Franconia, Saxony, Swabia, and Lorraine. Thus, Verona became herself seat of the imperial diet um, on this occasion with um, vassals, uh, the most important ones of the empire, in fact coming from all over the lands uh, of the dominion. Uh, Otto II in this sense is particular because as you know had an important Italian policy. Um, his son Otto III was also crowned emperor and he would rule uh, actually before being expelled from the same Rome. Um, as you know, Otto III died in 1002. This affected Verona, because, um, first of all, Italy was in revolt against uh, the Ottonians. The, the funeral procession of Otto III passed from, from the city. 
but even more importantly, at the death of Otto III, it was the Bavarian branch of the House of Saxony originally that became, I mean, held the, the imperial title with Henry II. So that was just across the Alps um, compared to, to the Mark. And given that some Italian feudal lords gathered in Pavia, where they elected Arduin of Ivrea as king of Italy, Verona found herself squeezed in between. As we've seen, um, Berenger II that we were talking about before as Marcion of, of Verona was actually Berenger of Ivrea. And Ivrea was in, in, from the other side, in the Po Valley in Piedmont. It was playing interesting games with France, with Germany. We will make a video about Mark of Ivrea. But as we've seen, it was also bitter rival with Verona as far as the northern Italian affairs were concerned. So much so that this um, Italian rebellion against what was factually against the, the Ottonian establishment, uh, at, at least now was kind of a bit watching what was happening, um, waged war against the bishop of Verona, Albert, right? And the bishop was defeated in battle. And the same fate then befell to the Duke of Carinthia Otto, who at that point held the Marquisate of Verona himself. Um, so this was a major uh, event. We never discussed it uh, in our manual history videos, but this was practically in, in, in the beginning of, of the 11th century, the last attempt of the Italian nobility to establish a national monarchy. After that, uh, the great uh, feudal powers of Italy would give way to the rising communes that did pretty interesting things, but in somehow a more fragmented way, and there was factually no king unless, you know, the, the German one came and was uh, crowned, so uh, in, you know, in Pavia or wherever with the Italic crown, and then uh, for going to Rome, as we've seen. Um, but at the time, this was not truly really known, right? It, as far as, especially the Ottonians were concerned, this m may, uh, w this was an open international challenge to their imperial authority. An imperial authority that, bear it in mind, was indestructibly associated with the Italian crown. So this meant that the Italian king at that point could crown himself emperor in Rome and the Germans would have been cut out of the, the game. But it wouldn't go like this, as we know. Henry of Bavaria to intervene in fact, the Ottonian entered Italy via a secondary pass at that point because the rebels had seized the Adige Valley and prevented the pass. Um, and at least there was a surprise attack which managed to outflank the enemy army and make it in flee. That's how Henry was able to enter Verona, probably, you know, well advised by Albert, who, who knew uh, the, the the ground and um, could also prepare his entry in the city. Um, in fact, in Verona were present also the Canossas, that, as you know, were, you know, as Marquises of Tuscany, some of the single most powerful. Um, noble family in in Europe at the time. They controlled basically a, the mark of Tuscany plus all these territories stretching from the Emilian Apennine to the, the, the Po Valley and uh, in fact part of the same uh, right, uh, I mean left bank of the river, so uh, being involved in, the, in those important passages. They had been fundamentally loyal to the Emperor because they, they realized that their um, their position could have been salvaged only by supporting uh, Bavaria against um, the Ivrians. And after a brief stop, Henry left for Pavia, where he was crowned King of Italy, um, thus managing to affirm his uh, preeminence in the Po Valley. The thing was complicated because the Ivrians controlled. Uh, yes, uh, at best one third of the Pau Valley per se, 
but they had supporters all over um, the kingdom. And Henry had to go down to Italy three more times, the, the last one in 1021. He stopped in Verona, where he held an imperial diet to quell the revolts. Um, in 1024, there was an expedition also by Conrad II, the salient who had succeeded uh, the last uh, Ottonian, thus starting the Franconian house uh, in Germany. And the Italian kingdom was not pacified at all, telling you the truth, um, because of the disgregational processes, so as we've seen of these major powers, we're still trying to um, essentially win the, the royal title, thus competing with, with a German one. Uh, reason for which Conrad II, after having spent Christmas in Verona decided to put an end um, to the state of affairs trying a major pacification um, which partially succeeded these were important moments in which also the um, Edictum de Beneficis for example was issued right for the inheritance of the minor fiefs that was important for the entire feudal right in Europe it was issued as a, an Italic capitulary by Conrad um, Wu died in 1039, in fact two years later after the dictum, um, and was succeeded by Henry III, who reviewed his imperial army in Verona and ascended there a second time for uh, settling private issues with the Canossas that in the meanwhile had expanded in the Po Valley were a aiming at the same uh, Verona's uh, control. Uh, this is quite interesting because you see how central really the city was um, in this balancing of, of the Italic kingdom. In 1046, Peter Cadalus, that would be the future antipope Honorius II, found just outside the Veronese walls the abbey complex of St. George in Braida, where famous monastic community of Benedictines settled to the prestige of, of the city. As we've seen, Verona had generally been loyal to the empire. Um, this was caused by the uh, obvious proximity with Germany and so the rather um, you know, absorption that uh, this had entailed in, in the orbit of a transalpine uh, monarchy rather than the in fact non-existent uh, Italic one. Um, so there weren't so many alternatives in spite of the you know, degree of autonomy that this partially uh, conferred to the city. During the investiture struggle, Verona was loyal to Emperor Henry IV, um, that as you know was renewing the struggle for Italy, given that the papacy had now affirmed her own um, independence in temporal affairs and even proclaimed her right fundamentally to dictate the the, the fact of the, the political line and the, the moral standards of the emperor's penalty the uh, the excommunication naturally the two powers were always um, side to side even in the bitterest um, clashes as you know Henry the fourth was humiliated uh, is communicated further. There were major wars that were being fought between Italy and Germany as a consequence of this because the German vassals were rebelling at, at excommunicated emperor. Italy had some imperial supporters uh, as well um, as we've just seen. Um, but the two universal powers were essentially just defining the two spheres of influence and essentially appreciating the fact that the dream of a unitary compact empire was very difficult to attain in a moment not just of um, let's say of, of Machino's development of the institutions and the gradual expansion of the same but together with in fact many autonomies uh, that the Italian communes were becoming to embody in the greatest way like this struggle was mostly fought over the Italian vassals that were de facto becoming the same cities that 
same decades at the end of the century would start giving themselves properly a communal orientation a communal regime that also spread systemically like we, as we've seen very often in in the Italian communal history videos um, like the the, the 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 various political institutional reforms um, the also the army development the the social changes were transversal all across central and northern Italy and thus as divided uh, apparently as the system was especially through the league systems um, the uh, especially the Guelph would, would come to be known that as the pro papal side would put up a, a dramatic um, resistance and providing enormous moral and material resources against the imperial armies that were some of the, the strongest of the time, also with with important success. Um, in fact, under Henry IV, what you see is that Lombard cities were uh, in, in great part also opposed to the emperor. All right here, the the phase of up to now we've talked about dukes, counts, marquises. Now this thing was gradually dissolving. Right, the the Italian feudal nobility that since Carolingian times had had some sort of resemblance also in the country, in the rural lifestyle and the, um, of the, uh, like in, in, in north of the Alps and so on, uh, came to be ever more strongly urbanized, not just in a kind of admini administrative sense uh, because of the uh, rights that pertain to the public circumscriptions that since also Ottonian times had been strongly reconfirmed um, on the base of the, especially of the capitular sees, uh, the pix episcopal power, and um, were the actual authors of the same commune. I mean, multiple videos on this topic, it was actually the milites, the knights, who created literally the commune, the consular government, the military establishment, and that began, in fact, from the base of the city to expand uh, the communal power also outside the city gates. Um, which is exceptional for medieval European standards, as elsewhere in Europe, cities didn't practically rule outside their, their city gates. Um, and this, in turn, complicated enormously the German intervention and imperial attainment in Italy, as you understand. Not just because, you know, in Rome it was the Pope that had to crown you, but because in between Rome and the Alps, you had basically half of some of the, the, the richest, most powerful um, polities of the time kind of opposing to you um, quite bitterly. So Verona, again, uh, had an enormous political and strategic appeal that would make gradually think the commune that was forming that they could have profited also f from larger autonomy rather than simply sticking to the empire. However, speaking of Henry IV specifically, on April the 10th, 1090, he organized an army made up mostly of Baronese troops in the city. And th this is another feature that will occur later on if you look at the Wars of the Lombard League. As you understand, uh, the emperor fought with a core of German troops, mostly ministerialist knights provided by the, the great um, bishops of Germany. And then also lots of Italians, right, with their milites, peditas, and so on. So these were the Ghibellines, as they would at least be called later. And uh, largely, uh, imperial forces in Italy were the vassal ones, the local ones. Um, and this, the fact of Verone's army attacked in 1090 Nogara, and also successfully besieged Mantua, another important center, not as important as Verona, but on, on the major waterways um, of, of northern Italy and thus crucial for that further stepping in towards the south by, by the Imperials. Um, in, in a second battle at Monteveglio, however, Henry's son died and for this he was buried in Verona in the Basilica of St. Zeno. Among other things, in the last years of Henry IV's stay in Italy, the Bishop of Verona was the Imperial Chancellor. Mm -hmm. Henry IV 
eventually returned to Germany in 1097. Um, but the Veronese uh, that were forming the commune at this point persisted in their hostility to papal reform. Right? This led to kind of a paradox that is the Pope Pascal II had to go to Germany following the fastest route, that is the Adige Valley, but he was, because uh, I mean, at that point the emperor had ordered so, but he was badly received still by, by the Bernays, who despised him so much that he had to change his ways, thus passing through Burgundy. And that's a hell of a tour, by the way, for, with the communications of the time. Uh, we're talking about several hundreds of kilometers across the Alps in, you know, also mu through much worse passages, telling the truth. So that's how powerful Verona was, even in the face of the papacy. There was a devastating earthquake in Verona on January the 3rd, 1117. This brought down the outer ring of the famous amphitheater. In fact, it's a bit like the Colosseum. You can see the, that there is an outer ring that it has collapsed. Um, and uh, at the time, it also destroyed numerous religious and civil buildings. Um, but this was the phase of, gr of rampant growth of the uh, medieval communities, especially the Italian cities. And so uh, the Veronese gave impetus to a season of intense rebuilding. It was actually a, a chance to renovate the space, uh, also because you know new one had been uh, disastrously created, as we've seen. A few years later, in 1122, uh, the investiture controversy ended uh, with the conquered that of Worms. Essentially, it was a compromise in which the Pope reserved himself the investiture for the um, the Italian bishops, where whereas the the emperor, the the one of, uh, of the German ones, even though they had to reciprocally. Um, let's say, confirm the thing, and so that was mostly about the primacy, as you understand, because, again, papacy and empire were indissoluble in, in that regard, and still the core point had not been solved. It's interesting to see what happened in Burgundy, that it was none of the two's area, uh, where things were negotiated, but more uh, originally. Um, at this point, Verona was, was counting like 10,000 inhabitants more. Uh, s urbanistically speaking, was divided into five districts. Um, four, so the quarters were corresponding to the ancient Roman regiones, the, the repartitions, um, that were the, the so called uh, major one, the Chiavica, the Ferri, and the Capitani. Whereas in the Middle Ages, in this encastellation process, um, a fifth known as the castle one, in fact, had uh, emerged, right, arising beyond the Adige River, too. So you understand there had been also a further expansion, right, uh, compared to the, to, the previous, uh, to the previous city. Consider that medieval cities were much more crowded than, medieval, uh, than Roman ones, right, so um, they were structured differently, they had other logics. In 1125, Henry V died, and the Count of Verona, that was the uh, San Bonifacio member, became as Marquis as Duke of the city, which was a sort of lordship over a city that, however, had a much more kind of communal profile now. Lothar of Saplenburg was proclaimed king in Germany. Um, this was a phase of profound turbulence that uh, had followed what was essentially the, the German defeat in Italy, uh, after which great part of the process started by the Ottonians and the Franconians in the attempt of creating a, a solid national monarchy kind of shipwrecked considerably so that, uh, considerably so that even the the rise of the Hohenstaufen and, and the expeditions in Italy and the incredibly brutal warfare that followed from that is, is a sort of, sort of this, um, a consequence of, 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 a, of a revenge feeling that had developed 
regarding the affairs of the kingdom that the, uh, at that point the German monarchs regarded as their own, right, as they had universally won the imperial power on them, except, again, uh, they, they hadn't quite been able to, to control it. Um, the, um, the, the, the 12th century is the period in which the kind of greater outline between what would have been called Guelphs and Ghibellines take place, right? It's mostly from the Italian 13th century. In fact, the name also in English derives from, from Italian, as you know, in German it would be Welfen and Weiblingen. Um, is, however, still the same um, repartition that had taken place um, between uh, the, in fact, the, the House of Welfen, that actually were Initially, the uh, the Este, they, they were actually Italian vassals of Germanic origins, but fundamentally had uh, passed again back in, in Germany and started to contend power to the, the Hohenstaufen that had in the castle of Weibling and their um, war cry, and that, that's why they were called Ghibellines. Um, and Verona, at this point, given the important political and social expansion of the commune was actually split between two sides, right? The Ghibelline one that after all was still prevalent uh, in the city with numerous exponents such as the Montecchi, the same ones of uh, that, you know, were made famous by Shakespeare's drama Romeo and Juliet because uh, but they, they're just inspired to these clashes between Guelphs and Ghibellines because of, of the inter- clan hatred, let's say, but the, the story, as you know, is completely invented. Um, and actually, a Guelph uh, power that um, was represented actually by the top exponents of the same San Bonifacio at this point, it, as we've seen, had also received some imperial offices, telling the truth, that however had a considerable power base, actually the majority of the city district, the countryside. Right, this aspect also we have discussed in, in a video regarding the mm, constant struggle between, let's say, the commune as the city, but also the political exiles that took uh, root in the countryside in their castles, and the RAS carried out guerrilla attack to supply chains of the commune, of um, the logistical one of the city, and so on. Um, so the traditional uh, Philo imperial policy of Verona was um, cracking at this point. The first consuls of the Veronese commune, that actually were three, differently from the, the Italian norm, because they were just like a collegial magistracy, like the, the two Roman consuls, right? Now there were three in Verona were elected also quite late, in 1136. This probably shows how the imperial control had prevented, um, in this era, kind of the development of the most advanced communal forms. I, uh, the commune was born later, uh, officially at least, because um, I've been speaking of commune here for the sake of you know, under making you understand w that there was a a political humus that was not just, again, a, a feudal appointee in, in charge of of um, of the mark that, by the way, considered this point was dissolving, right? With the communal spread um, and the, say, feudal decline, what was called the mark of Verona was now uh, is appearing. And, and not even that before um, the city of Verona had had technically the manpower to control the world mark, right? So it was just a broader repartition where R Verona was the most important center, but now also were others coming to compete. Um, and plus you have three consuls, which naturally is, um, uh, let's say, a, an excess of prudence, meaning that, of course, the two consuls have to watch each other's uh, work and back at the same time. But if you put three, it means that you don't really trust whoever is in charge, so it, it's not really a free rampant commune. And it is true that this northeastern Italian area was slightly less urbanized 
perhaps Verona is not the best example of this, but it was definitely, in the sense, uh, the most important city, right? Um, properly in a, in a urban sense, so it's also the place where the commune is somehow not necessarily stronger, because Padua would grow, for example, to be even more, but that, that is kind of later, but it's still Verona was bigger. And um, as a co but, but the rest of, of the region is a bit more feudal, meaning that the, um, the private landlords in the countryside with castles and so on are a bit more kind of aggressive, and uh, it's not like Lombardy and, and Tuscany where the city is really powerful, even though it was not really a, a state yet. Um, and there was a lot of private interference and uh, city and countryside were always connected. But the fact, especially that the consuls were of Verona were later increased to six, tells you again what kind of problem there really was. How can you command unitarily a city with six people that in theory had the by the way, the military power, right, it's pretty complicated. Um, the transition to the commune um, with the choice of Saint Zeno as patron saint, by the way, because it still the, the commune somehow developed as a, uh, in, in substitution of episcopal power of some sort, um, at least in the political military practice, is attested by a bas relief on the lunette of the proterum of the Basilica of San Zeno, dating back to 1138. And I often use it in the videos about the Italian communes, especially when you talk about warfare, because um, it, it represents beautifully uh, the saint appearing in the center. And from, from the two sides, the milites, so the feudal aristocracy, or at least the, the knights in the Italian communes, uh, elected because of census mostly, and the peditus, so the people, and in this sense the nascent bourgeoisie, sometimes also the fat people, um, that especially at this time were somehow also competing with each other because the, the, the nobility was the, the military class, the knightly one, and so they hegemonized a bit, powered the, the infantry at this point had practically lost um, uh, its uh, the, the possibility of defeating cavalry in open field, or at least was practically reaching that point by the mid-12th century. And so it's a nice scene because uh, this is depicted in, in front literally of the Basilica of the Patron Saint, and it's basically telling you how you know important it was for the city to remain unitary in face of these forces that were agitating within the same commune that were a split uh, at, at the same head of power with those six consuls that were all knights, right? But also the people that uh, was also starting to be particularly important because the economy was, was, was developing fast. Um, Verona is one of the many great urban centers in Europe that um, develops textile industry of some sort, the same scaligers actually seemingly were involved in that kind of business because they were commoners originally. Um, and um, there was essentially an oligarchy of about 10 clans uh, forming the Veronese establishment. Among them we find the uh, San Bonifacios, as we've seen, also the Ezzelines, already. We will talk about the latter especially in the next video. Uh, sharing communal power. In 1147 also Baldwin de la Scala was elected consul. He is one of the ancestors in fact of this Caligar family who would later rule Verona for more than a hundred years mm, before the Venetian conquest. And with the establishment of the communal regime, um, of course, also a more powerful struggle ensued because um, the institutions were strengthening, the various clans wanted to monopolize them, 
practically. And uh, part of the cohesion of the city stemmed from the metus hostilis deriving from the fact that uh, the word neighboring communes that were competing with Verona. Um, this is typical of the Italian scene when you have basically the, the city districts were at the largest of s some, some tens of kilometers and deeply uh, compressed, let's say, one of what is actually still the single most demographically concentrated area um, in Europe. The main enemies of Verona were Ferrara hmm, in the south that mostly was say not so directly problematic but uh, it had a, an important influence on the Po mouth and, and the other waterways and it had um, uh, it would develop an important and thus unitary dynasty. It was much of a strong commune, but still uh, um, somehow militarily, almost feudally oriented power. Then Treviso uh, in the east that um, grew to, to considerable power close, to, close to, to Venice, at least in this communal competition, and Padua that would be actually the major uh, rival of Verona that as we will see will finally win the struggle over the Paduans at some point they were actually more powerful than Verona but um, managed uh, but were less united were more, more of a popular government that had uh, fought against tyranny whereas Verona developed a seigniory of her own and um, managed to crush, thanks to unity uh, of command, the, this kind of republican rivals. Um, and, and other, this, these are just some of the cities, but say there were others and leagues, etc. And there would be a crescendo of hostilities, especially in the 12th to 13th century and beyond. In 1151, the Veronese consuls were replaced by the Veronensium Rector, in turn replaced in 1169 by the Podesta, like in other Italian communes that somehow homogenized with the, the political regime of Verona through the rest of the, of the kingdom. Um, and the Podesta was known properly uh, captain and rector of the Gastals, that were the original kind of uh, public officials of uh, the Longbird kings, and um, and uh, of the uh, of the crafts and of the all the people, mm. and that stresses again how um, let's say articulated the Veronese politics and society uh, still was, and so also how conflictual it was. On March the 4th, 1152, Frederick I of Odenstaufen, known as Barbarossa, ascended the throne. We talked about him multiple times, and we have seen how, aside from what I said before regarding the, uh, say, the, the recompaction, say, of German power under the Odenstaufen, he properly carried out uh, a, a universal project um, of reunification of, of Germany and Italy under the same rule, right? He was well backed because his father had provided him with an important amount of castles, of power base in, in Swabia. Um, the Hohenstaufen were actually a minor dynasty, but they managed to marry in, in the Franconian dynasty because they had been the the only ones that practically remained loyal to Henry IV after he was uh, excommunicated in the end. They were rewarded. Frederick descended both from the uh, the Gibbon, say the Hohenstaufen and the Welfen at the same time. So this was very promising because he managed with his cousin, the, the Duke of Saxony, to have a sort of shared, uh, shared uh, distinct shared areas of influence in Germany but problems would answer uh, about that as well. So I made multiple videos about him, so, and I will keep making them, so there's a lot to know. 
And you know that in 1154 he uh, descended in Italy for the first time of the many he would, uh, namely because the Romans had actually kicked out the Pope out of their city because they wanted to create their own commune. And so this was formally the, the let's say, the, 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 the official pretext. The much more concerning one, actually, was Milanese expansionism. Uh, I made a video about the, the expansion of Milan during the 12th century, and essentially he was coming to threaten the, na the neighbors, and Milan was essentially, at this point, actually the largest city in Europe. Um, very powerful, um, you know, important trade activities, um, a very important arms and armor industry. And it had begun to expand its own district, right, the commune, literally taking over the, the, the local, the rural lords that were actually also imperial vassals and so on. This was quite, mm, like, it was unconceivable for anyone living, for example, in, in Germany, like, the, 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 in a country where people were traditionally somebody else's and the princes ruled everywhere, the, 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 there was no such thing like the commoners ruling, Milan actually dictating rule over uh, aristocrats was just like a world upside down from their perspective. And it were two very different worlds. This didn't help uh, Barbarossa's enterprise because there was surely a cultural mm, gap there that uh, was exploited by by the Lombards. And Milan at this point had harassed the commune of Lodi, who's a neighbor of Milan, uh, which had asked help to the emperor, also together with lots of other complaints from other Italian communes, also for reasons that were unrelated with Milan, but mostly connected with the problem of, again, these communes being born out of literally themselves that were starting to take over the traditional bishop count power. And um, in, a, in, an imper in a German imperial perspective, like if you look at the lists that also Barbarossa made when for the diets, etc. Lombardy figured habitually uh, among uh, the, you know, the German, uh, the German vassals, etc. Because the, all these cities, they're still feudal representatives, uh, either uh, in the countryside or also in the urban center, were 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 important. They were again wi within these very rich centers that the emperor wanted to reconquer unavoidably was definitely the most sensible choice to try as a German king to uh, to subdue uh, Italy to pursue again a kind of Mediterranean imperial policy that was the ultimate goal of both the Hohenstaufen and those who actually opposed them and when they came to power did the same exact thing. The problem this was an enormous enterprise and it cost I enormously Right, so Germany at this point was the most powerful entity in Europe, um, in at least in Western Europe, and um, it, it had an enormous military power that was waged, uh, in fact, dramatically in Italy, to which the Lombard and Berlinese lead opposed, as we will see, in turn, enormous resources, and managing to make the imperial policy fail, also defeating the emperor in open field. Um, the uh, Frederick's m m policy was pretty, um, pretty straightforward. He aimed at the subjection of the communes of the peninsula, because these had, on a legal base, usurped some imperial powers. What this practically meant is that the taxes that were previously collected by imperial officials, given that the, um, the, the emperors had uh, not been present in Italy from generations and had never quite had a, a direct control of the country, um, were had been regularly uh, taken over by the communes, who were just also expanding the local cities governing them, administering just, by the way, it means that they were civilly and, um, you know, juridically, dramatically more advanced than anything that existed in Europe at that time. And um, so 
and in practice what what Frederick really wanted was to get uh, all the revenues literally and this was a pretty uncompromising point that brought communes that had initially supported him such as even Lodi that had called him to defend him from Milan to side with Milan who was the most important center as we've seen the center of the league of the Lombard League and to oppose him ferociously so um, but t today we don't have time to, to tell the entire story but Barbarossa destroyed castles, towns and entire cities such as Asti, Tortona, Spoleto throughout Italy um, these were incredibly brutal means. Um, Frederick had an enormous personal energy, was considered one of the most warlike rulers of his times, a great knight, and surely embodied that um, perfectly in the, uh, also in the ruthlessness that that task uh, entailed, as we have explained often what a medieval knight really does. Um, however, in this first expedition that was a series of very tough mm, you know accidents including um, the fact that the imperial army was struck by a plague that was said you know spread because the, there were Byzantine agents in Italy everywhere preventing this kind of re-Germanization of the country and uh, sabotaging the food of the German army poisoning it uh, polluting it and um, there were huge problems. He was to he was in Lombardy. He was to Rome, where um, and the Romans also kind of rebelled. Even though the Pope was reinstated, um, he tried to besiege Ancona, but it didn't work out successfully. And so it was a terrifying thing. And, and when Frederick had to pass through Verona to, to come back to Germany, uh, where in fact, uh, as he had in fact laid a pontoon bridge, built to cross the Adige, to rise up eventually the valley, just outside the civil, uh, the city walls, he was attacked, right, just as he had crossed the bridge, um, by the Veronese, um, that essentially destroyed some of the trunks, uh, some of, of, of the pontoon, right, and um, put up some important resistance. Um, Barbarossa also was famous for this kind of uh, rage outbursts as he was really like uh, you know his cousin was known as a lion but I think he embodies that well and he um, basically managed to to force the, the blockade and crushed some Veronese resistance and had the noses of the uh, Veronese that were present in his ranks cut off right even if they were innocent Right, these are the means that were carried out, and that this is something, by the way, to which the the communes themselves were kind of not habituated. First of all, this request, like of giving everything, uh, mainly the fodrum, which was necessary to support the logistics, especially of the knightly armies for their horses and so on. But in, it, it, the the emperor's requests um, extended by far to to lots of other activities that the communes were also legitimately seen as um, just a, a product of, of their own enterprise rather than something that the emperor could claim on th that, that amount of, of resources. Consider this that, of course, today we feel, I think, instinctively more sympathy towards um, who rebels to oppression, uh, and there was surely an excess uh, by the side of of of, of the Imperials, but at the same time um, uh, Frederick had been crowned King of Italy, right? There were some taxes that were owed to him. Um, he could have negotiated, he could have compromised to the degree, right? And this was not done, right? So both sides fundamentally wouldn't understand each other. It's quite interesting because literally also from a linguistic point of view, um, it's very historically incorrect uh, to frame this struggle as, say, Germans versus Italians. But it's also true that when the sides negotiated, which did happen, by the way, very, for very long, they would, one side would speak German, one side would speak Italian vocally in, during the debate with translators that, as you know, would also try basically to alter 
some of the words, etc. And then the problem is they had to write the pact in Latin. And every side wanted to write one word in a way or in another so that uh, that could make uh, a lot of difference according to. So this surely didn't help. The Germans actually were radically impressed by what they found uh, in Italy in terms of sheer civil, economical, literary, even military development. Um, the Im imperial counselors advised uh, Frederick to like start some educational programs in Germany, model on the base of what they saw in Italy, where maybe even part of the peasantry was literate, um, and this could have benefited the entire, um, you know, say that that project of centralization. After all, that that the German kings were with enormous difficulty, a bit in the same way against the the German princes trying to carry out in their same country. Um, Frederick was also in very intelligent, telling the truth uh, regarding some some particular aspects of this development. Because, for example, he supported the University of Bologna because. Uh, the local jurists were supporting; ro they, were, they were recovering Roman law, which uh, basically affirmed the superiority of the emperor over the church, like in the Byzantine world. Um, and so, this could provide with enormous benefits for the empire in the, in the investiture struggles. Um, so, surely this was a great um, school, right, of uh, European development in, in the process, because the struggles were as bitter as hybridizing and mm, say profitable right we've seen also with other cities uh, like Pisa about which I made two videos each how for example a, a hardcore gibbling city like that one was uh, deeply involved in imperial policy in these very years uh, in favor of the Hohenstaufen and, and how so much politically strategically logistically was really at stake um, in the support of this or uh, this other city, right? So the fact that the Veronese opposed themselves to, to Frederick, considering what were normally their spirits, um, leaning towards uh, in the time of the last imperial presence uh, in Italy, will really tell you that a lot had changed. The, the commune of Verona essentially wasn't signing the empire, uh, at least by that degree, anymore. Um, in fact, Barbarossa held the commune of Verona for what had happened um, at the locks, because the, the commune was not mm, wholly, right, as we've seen, either pro or against uh, Frederick. So this brought, however, to the emperor enforcing Verona to promise him military aid in the event of his war against Milan. That was by far the most important um, struggle at that point. Because at that point, the same Lombardy was a bit beginning to gravitate around uh, Milan. Maybe, you know, by the mid 12th century, it's a bit anachronistic, but definitely at least the, the, the destruction of Milan that even happened, but the Milanese were built it from, from scratch, um, would have dispirited dramatically all the other uh, Lombard cities. In 1157, Barbarossa prepared a new descent. He immediately occupied Brescia, that as we've seen is um, uh, just west of Verona, after which he advanced towards the Adda River, meeting and defeating there the Milanese army. Mm -hmm. The struggle between the the Germans and the Lombards is, is quite interesting because, in spite of the, as we've seen, the bit of the mix of um, also Italian presence in the German army, uh, we, we're looking at uh, literally two two different countries that uh, had double. The, the, the military systems were quite similar, but just, you know, the, the, the Germans passed for the, the most uh, valorous and um, aggressive and and brutal um, knighthood and youth in general, whereas the, the Italians were already being seen as, you know, these are a people of merchants, they don't have strong arms. And telling you the truth, uh, when you look at these clashes, you realize um, 
pretty brutal match uh, where the it may be true that the, the the German cavalry was stronger, especially in impetus. But the Italians had stronger infantry, and and there is all a military history, especially of infantry development uh, in Europe that passes through episodes such as Carcano, Legnano, etc. That that is worth uh, analyzing. I made years ago a video about the Battle of Legnano, but it's so old that it sucks. <laughs> so, and I think. Uh, by the way, I learned new things in the meanwhile, so maybe it would be better remade. But, you know, the the core information is, is contained in that video. Um, so, given that the war against Milan had resumed, uh, Frederick had asked the help of the Italian cities, including Verona. And the Emperor reminded the Veronese specifically of their obligation made because of the accident of the logs. Um, and thus, also thanks to the, to the Veronese support, the Emperor managed to, to gather a pretty big army um, of you know, multiple tens of thousands of men, which by the time is uh, remarkable, normally made up by, at uh, this point, the the ratio of cavalry infantry is 1 to 10, classically, not always, mm -hmm. but at least in the largest armies, considering perhaps some infantry was not really fighting force, but roughly. And at this point, cavalry is, again, the size of an open field. Like, infantries do not make it that to, to, to beat it. And this was a bit the general mindset already. Um, there had been some instances in which infantry had managed to defeat cavalry in the early Middle Ages, but they were rare already. But what impressed the Germans is that the Lombard infantries withstood their cavalry charges. I mean, cavalry would always be decisive anyway, so the Lombard cavalry had to either win or lose the whole thing, but the infantries were particularly resilient, and in their contribution saved the day in the in the broader balance. Uh, Piclagnano we will see in a while. Um, for the rest, these forces were somehow homogeneous, both technically and, uh, you know. And uh, this enormous army brought Milan to surrender after a month. In uh, so here I'm skipping completely all the uh, politic extremely complicated political, military, social history in the meanwhile, because we know pretty much in detail what happened, so I, for some reason I didn't talk very much about the Lombard League on Schwerpunkt, and we have to make up for that, because um, it's really a huge chapter of medieval history, uh, not just you know for the extended history, but throughout the, the centuries, but just even for this single wars. Um, in 1163, Barbarossa came back again to Italy and held an imperial diet in Lodi where he established that the fleets of Genoa and Pisa should be placed at his disposal in the event of an attack on Sicily because naturally the reactivation of German power in Italy entailed uh, not just the subjugation of the, of, of the northern kingdom but uh, also of the southern one which uh, would have been weakened by imperial reinforcement in Italy anyway, was also threatened by the Byzantines, and there were also internal troubles, uh, and as you know, and as we've seen very often, the, um, the Oehenstaufen would, would manage to inherit it dynastically, so that, but wars were actually waged uh, against the Siculo Normans too. That's why, as we've seen in the videos about Genoa and Pisa, the Italian navies was were, were crucial to carry out a, a, a campaign against an island, fundamentally, that also did have some maritime potential on its own. But this is the reason why Genoa and, and Pisa especially were so uh, ghibelline-oriented, because uh, the emperors would just grant them autonomies in exchange for the fleets, and not oppress them particularly. Given that we're also kind of less interested in interland possession, 
whereas uh, say the communes of the Pau Valley were continental powers so they did you know they just needed to be secured as the, the entire land mass of the Pau Valley was uh, enormously rich as we've seen it uh, connected also with the Adriatic for eventual expedition with against the, the Byzantines and it, it was part of this grand project of Roman imperial restoration by the side of the Hohenstaufen. Um, but I in the meantime, 16, uh, in 63, an anti-imperial league was formed, guess by whom? Verona, Venice, Padua, Vicenza, and Ferrara. This took the name of Veronese League because it was headed by Verona. More precisely in Latin, the, this was the Veronensis Societas, so the Veronese Society. The composition is quite interesting because you have basically all the major northeastern Italian cities connected, also Venice that doesn't like to be squeezed by major powers and just want to remain decentralized in all. Um, and um, Padua, Vicenza, Ferrara, as we've seen, uh, you know, gravitating in the area around. In fact, Venice, the, the Palm Mount, and Verona that control uh, controls the Adige Valley. So the Veronese League, it's rarely remembered, but it was actually a pain in the behind for Barbarossa, who arrived at the gates of Verona, stopping near Vigazio, where he waited for some conspirators um, contacted within the city to open the gates. But in the meantime, the army of the Veronese League arrived near the German camp, forcing the emperor to retire to Germany. This power show off is remarkable because it tells you what was the military power of even relatively few um, Italian city states combined to match the imperial one. Um, and as we will see, Verona has some record also for later times, because I spoiler for the next video. Um, by the early 14th century, again, few people even know about the city or the, the La Scala, but uh, the, the local seigneury had the, the second largest military in Europe after the Kingdom of France. Uh, I'll bite for, for a limited amount of time, but still, right? Um, upon Pope Alexander III's return to Rome, Barbarossa decided to um, intervene again for um, the papacy notoriously didn't want the empire to expand in Italy that um, the pontiffs regularly saw as essentially their courtyard um, and had historically always had enormous contentions for the, if anything, the juridical, the legal ownership of many regions including for example Ferrara uh, not only but that's far from Rome um, consider that the, the same Siculo Norman kingdom in theory was a papal vassal right and the, the the political fragmentation of central and northern Italy favored this kind of um, further ambitions um, of hegemony because as you know in the Middle Ages you never have kind of a direct centralized absolute statal control by any stretch of the imagination reason for which however claiming some sort of broader influence on an era rather than another is is, is significant in the case of Barbarossa you, you see how you practically have to to mold one right um, um, and the Pope supported of course the the communes the leagues the Lombard League um, uh, at this point so Frederick descended again in Italy and the Veronese managed to stop the Emperor at the lock of Rivoli. Frederick was therefore forced to deviate from the Adige Valley because there was no way to, to break through the Veronese block and he passed through the Camonica Valley uh, which is a narrower one, it's much more complicated um, and th think just about the time lost in on you know in the schedule 
you know, all these cities that are rebelling in old time lost this, this time this centers reinforce right and if you take out one another rebels and the other one has time to rebuild so th that's that messed up there if you read the german liberalistic against frederick barbarossa in, in germany in fact uh, you have these interesting metaphors such as um, Barbarossa being the lion and trying to, with his paws, to, to, to tip all the various ants' nests that instead, you know, pour out of everywhere. <laughs> and at the end of the day, the lion breaks down. Um, in Reinhard Fuchs, for example, there is such a thing. Because um, naturally there were lots of problems in Germany going on, including this fact opposition to to Barbarossa's rule at the Battle of Legnano arguably it said that you know the Germans lost because the Duke of Saxony refused to send his troops mm -hmm. that was a, an old problem of German military organization we also talked about it um, and uh, Frederick at some point was something very powerful for those times because he was an incredibly proud man but he kneeled in front of Henry uh, as his cousin and, and uh, you know he, he asked him for the troops because that that's how much he had invested himself in Italy as a political image right so it was a fierce struggle we have examples of those who can't lose in a sense and are able to to prolong the the war in, in, in enormous ways. I mean, all these campaigns were were extremely destructive. Um, in the meantime, Cremona, Mantua, Brescia, and Bergamo had allied themselves. These were just all west of Verona, but pretty close, as you understand. Cremona is closer to Milan. The others, as we've seen, also Bergamo, totally true, but Mantua and Brescia are closer to Verona, right? So uh, they are basically the same places, the same people, right? the same country in a way. Um, in the following month the Lombard League proper was born, formed by Milan, Ferrara, Lodi, Parma and Piacenza. This is more of a um, kind of, um, in fact, Lombard proper league, but Lombardy at the time was intended broadly right uh basically the, the entire Po Valle in some sort even parts of today's Piedmont or the, the right bank of the Po River and beyond even certain in fact Venetian cities could be considered long because because Lombard was the name of the Longobard kingdom right so uh, the Italians were known as Lombards abroad so there was a lot of approximation uh, Maybe Tuscans wouldn't be considered as Lombard within Italy, of course, but abroad they were, for example. So that's kind of interesting. And in 1167, the two leagues combined, the Veronese and the Lombard one, formed the so-called Concordia, the Concord, right? So they united, and we're talking about an impressive host. Bergamo, Bologna, too. So the one that Frederick had endowed with those privileges for the local university, that however was a sort of concurrent power with the commune. Interestingly enough, we discussed this when we made those videos about um, medieval universities. Um, Brescia, Cremona, Ferrara, Lodi, Mantua, Milan, Modena, Novara, Padua, Piacenza, uh, Reggio in, in Emilia, Treviso and Venice, Vercelli, Verona and Vicenza. So we're talking basically about almost all the Pope Ballet combined. At this point Barbarossa was in Rome because he had decided to have himself crowned again to reinforce his international prestige. Shortly afterwards however his army was struck by plague again right, and forced to retreat. This was the fifth invasion of Italy, the fifth, um, and he attempted the attack to the cities of the Lombard League. 
right? The point was always like kind of besieging one and essentially prompting the the others to intervene. And the, you know most pitch battles in the Middle Ages were triggered like that. In the aforementioned Battle of Legnano, uh, twelve thousand soldiers, including three hundred knights of Verona, defeated the imperial army. Four thousand men that were mostly knights, so if we consider the, the general situation, probably the, the numbers were much more balanced, because for, I think it was 2,500 um, knights from, from the imperial side, so that means at least like, you know, a triple number of troops. Um, and big battles are usually very balanced. Um, in, in this considered that the Veronese and the, the Brescians had left their infantry in defense of Milan in the meanwhile. So surely the league was huge and it had even troops to spare in a sense, but infantry, as we've seen, was also not considered particularly useful, except at the Battle of Legnano, the Lombard infantry showed off dramatically because basically the imperial cavalry managed to break the um, uh, the 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 Lombard one that fled the field. Um, so at that point, they thought it's won, and the the Lombard infantry was basically uh, deployed on behind a, a trench, um, rallying around their carroccio. It was essentially a a cart with the and the symbol of the people, of the peditus, rather than the commune, the city. So they, they felt very much for it with the symbol of the saint, the, the bell that rang when, you know, the, the militias in the city were alarmed by corpse and so on. And they put up a stand that the, the Germans weren't able to break, at least before, uh, some Milan rallied Milanese knights supported by Brescian ones that were reaching the field because these battles were, as we've seen also in the league, quite participative and so there was a coordination and timing uh, came back on the field and attacked the imperial cavalry from the side the, 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 the Lombard infantry actually crossed the ditch and counter-attacked the cavalry the emperor's banner was downed uh, the same Barbarossa was unhorsed and they thought he, w he was dead like he reappeared days after um, far away having you know risked to be killed or captured running through the forest whatever um, it was a dramatic victory that cannot be stressed and especially from 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 a communal perspective you, you realize that these people were obsessed with especially with with the prisoners how much um, and signs and horses, etc. They had captured. It. They had an enormous pride. They had defeated the Holy Roman Emperor in open field. The Imperium was theirs, so much so that Frederick was practically obliged by the circumstances to sign the Peace of Constance in 1183, which basically uh, reaffirmed the communal autonomies of the of the cities that were listed all in the in the agreement, so that the pride again of these m municipalities as such as individually having contributed to, to the victory um, was extraordinary, nothing short of extraordinary. Um, on, on this occasion, uh, the Veronese Carroccio was also born, um, and this was carried in procession on the occasion also of the great festivities, um, and it was jealously guarded in the same basilica of St. Zeno, so it was properly the heart of the city as such. Right. Uh, unfortunately, it went destroyed in the s in the 16th century. In March 1182, uh, also Rome revolted against the new Pope Lucius III, uh, who sought refuge, however, in Verona. At this point, mm, of course, we cannot um, digress too much on the broader implications of. Uh, the victory of Legnano. I mean, it was it, it made the entire Mediterranean and European political strategic asset uh, collapse. Right it, in the in the Holy Land, for the Byzantine Empire in southern Italy, 
um, the most, some of the most fateful vassals of Barbarossa in Italy itself, such as the Marquises of Montferrat, as which side it was incredibly important because some of them were kings of Jerusalem. In the same Germany, lots of things changed. Um, so th there, th there are studies on this, and I will probably advise you at some point uh, some s some good ones. But even seeing it from a Byzantine perspective uh, is is fascinating because it tells you how deeply intertwined literally every single thing that happened anywhere here made the difference for the entire system. Um, so to make the long story short, the Battle of Legnano made Barbarossa finally banning out of the possibility of subjugating um, the communes, right? That weren't absolutely fighting, say, against the institution. They were fighting against the imposition of, say, the men, right, as such. And for the rest, they were loyal imperial subjects because they thought, as any me medieval, in this case, Italian, that there was there had to be an emperor that that was the Roman Empire and that there had to be an emperor papacy and that the world cannot work without that and we're talking about the 12th century I mean it's an inc incredibly archaic and primitive time and people are very close to that sense of for example of nobility deriving from freedom of arms which the Italian communes had been founded on the principle of the exercitus right something that you can see the late antique cities in Italy already boasted through epigraphy the sense of the, the, that clan, that outer, the fact that they were free, they had free militias, right? So um, we're talking about probably deeply, um, if not underappreciated, surely overlooked uh, realities. Uh, that's why we need to talk about them. And Verona is fully within this this context. Emperor Barbarossa in 1184 actually made a sixth and last descent into Italy. On this occasion, given that he was working for also his heirs, um, you know, that they would inherit in one in one block the entire kingdom of Sicily, so it was still something they could they, they had to do as, as as an emperor. And also as we will see because he had plans of crusade, as you know, to win the sympathy of the cities of the Mark of Verona. Right? And in the process, given that the, um, consider the, the peace of Constance had uh, been just the year before, all the communal representatives had been there, the emperor had agreed, so it was a quite big official thing. The fact that the year after he came back, specifically in the Mark of Verona to uh, reinforce kind of the, at that point, the alliance with them is quite, quite meaningful. A bit for the same reason of the Adige Valley in the Brenner Pass. Uh, in the meantime, the Veronese Council was held in the city, uh, which was attended by the emperor himself, uh, who was staying by the way, at the Abbey of St. Zeno, right, in which um, the Cathars, the Patarians, and the, Val the Valdensian and the Arnoldists were condemned on the occasion. Uh, this is still an imperial duty. We made some videos about each of these um, heretics. Uh, we talk about the Cathars, the Patarians, the Valdensians, and Arnold from Brescia. So if you're interested in any of them you can simply check my I created I think a medieval heresies and heterodoxy playlist so you can check that out if you're interested individually and all these movements by the way were deeply intertwined with what was going on uh, like Arnold of Brescia had caused the revolt in Rome to Barbarossa just to make an example so we're talking about deep uh, deeply practical reasons behind this this arrangements because they were political um, and, and military alike. In 1185 uh, Lucius III died and was buried in the Cathedral of, the, of Verona where he still rests today. Just imagine the importance of Verona in all this uh, scene, right? Uh, seat of imperial diet, 
for the emperor would come to hold council from Germany where popes would be buried and um, children of emperors would be buried uh, right Lucius was su succeeded by Urban the third who was um, in fact uh, made Pope in Verona and more precisely in Castle St. Peter in the presence of Frederick Barbarossa interestingly enough during his stay uh, Frederick also tried to reconcile the Montecchi and the San Bonifacios interestingly enough because um, he wanted a stable Verona for his future crossings had he had to do that um, in in any case after the end of imperial pressure of course the Italian communes began to pursue their own autonomistic policies and starting to quarrel against each other making wars and so on for example Verona herself in 1188 started the war with Ferrara uh, mostly over the rights over the um, the lower po waterways um, so enormously lucrative business that was worth uh, being fought over um, as a consequence there were battles for example in some villages of the Polesina area which count as the first territorial expansion of Verona which is very interesting we were talking about Milan before creating this outer district as a communal domination well Verona is smaller but uh, as other communes starts doing exactly this and in this case also clashing with another city such as Ferrara um, also in this period a certain number of Veronese soldiers took part in the Crusades right you wonder the various Europeans that went overseas um, contributing um, to the to the to the crusading effort and it's interesting and also somewhat ironic that uh, here they also participated in some number during the third crusade right during which Barbarossa died just the other day we were talking about Angevin England and um, Richard the first um, exploit at Acre right well at, at the storming of Acre Baronet's troops participated in the meantime the war with Ferrara continued right and for this reason the Veronese uh, allied themselves with the Mantuans because Mantua is a bit in between the two cities and more from the from the Veronese side and is also practically um, next to, to the same Pau River so um, this uh, the, the control that mm, Verona could have on, on the waterway somehow uh, facilitated the, the, the side to which Mantua was compared to to Ferrara it was down the down river instead um, and uh, at the same time Verona managed to expand and secure on the eastern coast of the lake Garda mm. it's very close to Verona and that also was a pretty lucrative business because there was a traffic uh, uh, trade speaking in, in the Garda lake and um, there were resources coming from it and so on so Verona secures her west bank that arrives up to uh, the, the lake um, also the commune finally establishes a firm control of the lock of Rivoli that had been yes exploited as we've seen successfully halting the imperial advance uh, back in the day but uh, hadn't been say firmly secured by by the city infrastructurally at that point uh, in 1198 the war with Ferrara ended but it was Mantua at this point that evidently was also pressured from the other side by, by, by Verona to attack the Veronese um, and Verona was more powerful and won um, so that two alliances resulted one 
basically brought Verona, Ferrara, Treviso and Vicenza together, right? Um, Ferrara was kind of a, a broader one that mostly involved mostly the, 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 the Paul River way that arrived to the sea, so it, it was naturally kind of worthier, but in, in front of closer enemies, um, it's still somehow secondary and or functional now to to some sort of broader Veronese territorial expansion was rather around the city and not Ferrara that is distant, right? From the other side you have Mantua, Padua and Ravenna. Mm, consider that Ravenna is even beyond Ferrara. So th they are very long range alliances and by cities that start reasoning at th that scale of political and territorial interaction. Padua is uh, in the east of, of Verona, as we were saying before, they would become bitter enemies. And Mantua, too, also was, as we've seen, already enemy of Verona and starts uh, remains enemy with Ferrara. In, in between, there isn't much, uh, but so much, in fact, that not even the terrain is so suitable for a prolonged warfare. And I would stop the video here, because if we arrive to... Uh, 1201, at least we enter in the 13th century, we see Frederick II's crowning in Palermo as king of Sicily, right? And this changed a lot because the Second Lombard League was formed and uh, Barbarossa was dead at this point, as you know, and also Frederick's father, Henry VI. Frederick was Barbarossa's grandson and he would uh, reign state some of policies and, and strategies that his grandfather had enacted against the, Saint the Lombards. But that's also another story because it involves uh, a different political and institutional context for the Italian communes so that also for Verona must be carefully uh, explained. Um, so we will treat kind of the here practically the late medieval context a bit more carefully uh, on its own in the next video probably tomorrow right and for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye